is whatever time it is for you. <laughs> 4.30 for me, 7.30 for those on the East Coast. I have no idea what time it is for Mario. But he, probably the middle of the night somewhere. But welcome to all of you. I am Coram Deo, 1.30 a.m. Good grief. <laughs> I would be a zombie at that time. I am Coram Deo. I am your host for Tuesday night, and we have been going through the book of Romans. There is a link above. If you look in your screen there, you'll see a link to our study notes. If you like to follow along with study notes, as some like to do. So welcome to each one of you. Today we are in, yes, I do, actually seven, but I read until nine um, or 9.30. Uh, welcome to our uh, Bible study. Today's passage seems to serve as a section heading for what seems to come later in Romans 12. In other words, the admonitions that we will see in these verses define what it means to genuinely love as Christ loved. So understanding what the apostle teaches in these verses will help us to know what true love looks like. And it will keep us from giving into the false ideas of love that are present in our own culture. So our format for tonight is worship, prayer, study, comments, and questions. And we begin with a song. And your song should be able to play right here in your room as we worship together. So just click on the song, play the song, and when you are done, Click done and we will continue with our study. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Oh, how good and blessed it is when we're together. Precious soil on the head, like the dew as it falls on the mountain. God's blessing flows. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. With life forevermore. God forevermore With life forevermore With you forevermore So why do we fight so much When you've already So we fight for love to be one as you are one. So why do we go to war when you've already won us at the cross? So now let us fight for love. As you are one, souls are one, as we are one, so make us one, as you are one. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. good and blessed it is when we're together the precious soil on the head like the dew as it falls on the mountain God's blessing flows oh how 
how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. The life forever. Amen. And I, uh, if you did not get to listen to that psalm, I pinned it to the top of the channel so you can watch it later. Great psalm. And it's a great way to start off this passage of scripture, how blessed it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Um, let me see if I can... Uh, Yes, I can get it all. Um, I love the last verse of that psalm when he talks about it's like the, the dew of Hermon, Hermon, which falls on the mount, mountains of Zion. But look at that last verse for there, that is in our unity. There, the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. Think of it. When we walk together in love and in unity, God is commanding his blessing over us. That's amazing. I, don't, I can't think of anywhere in scripture where it says that God commands his blessing to his people. Well, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the unity that you have given us because we are in Christ. That means that anybody who is also in Christ, anyone who is a brother or sister, we are united to them by faith. We are one body, one people, one Lord for your glory alone. Help us to learn to walk in unity, in love, and in blessing. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. No, I didn't sing over the mic. So our scripture today as we continue in Romans chapter 12 is this. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. 
Now, the last time that we were in the book of Romans, we read about the church being a community, a body, a body of Christ. There is more to living as a Christian than just your own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That is of utmost importance to your faith, but there's so, so much more. God expects us to live within community. This passage defines something else about being a community of faith. We must look closely at what distinguishes us from the rest of the world. It could be many things, but it should primarily be love for one another. So we are to live as a community of love. Now, love is a word that's often used and often misused. Love is a thing that is desired. It's talked about. It's even sung about in many, many songs. Many artists have made their greatest hits singing about this thing called love. <laughs> Let me give you just a, a few of them. John Lennon, he once sang, all you need is love. The Righteous Brothers, okay, some of you may not be old enough to remember the Righteous Brothers, but they claim that some had lost that love and feeling. Queen wrote a song called A Crazy Little Thing called Love. Huey Lewis once sang a song called The Power of Love. Stevie Wonder just wanted to call to say, I just want to call to say I love you. I won't sing it. Whitney Houston claimed to have found the greatest love of all. And if you remember the Christian group, DC Talk, they, they, they sang a song called Love is a Verb. All kinds of songs about love. But when sin entered the world, its immediate effect was to damage relationship. Adam and Eve were instantly separated from the God whose fellowship they had formerly enjoyed. Guilt prompted them to try to hide from him, and they were suddenly estranged not only from God, but they were estranged from each other. Before sin, they were naked and unashamed in one, one another's presence. But after they sinned, they sewed fig leaves together to try to hide their shame from one another. Sin always damages relationships. Let me repeat that. Sin always damages relationships. And so the whole thrust of the word of God is to show us how we can and how we should love God with all of our being and to love one another as we in fact love ourselves. To love God, we must first understand that he loved us first. Romans 5 verse 8 puts it plainly, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Christ had to die to pay the just penalty for our sin that we deserved. God offers a full pardon and complete justification as a gift to all who will trust in Jesus Christ. Believing the gospel reconciles us to God and floods our hearts with his love so that we can begin the lifelong battle of loving him and others more and more and more. And it is, it's a lifelong battle. Because of indwelling sin, our default mode is to be selfish, not to sacrifice ourselves in love for God and for others. And so the Christian life is a constant battle to dethrone self and, and, and to enthrone Christ. It's not automatic. It's not instantaneous. It's a battle. And one of the most practical tests 
of whether Christ is truly our Lord is seen in our relationships. Am I growing in sincere love from the heart for my family, for my fellow believers, and the, the unbelievers that I know and have contact with? That's the question. Sincere love for God always spills over into sincere love for others. Amen. This is the consistent message of the New Testament. The Apostle John unmasks our tendencies towards hypocrisy in the matter of love when he writes these words. And actually, Psalmist, you gave me the verse before. <laughs> in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the perpetuation for our sins. We love because he first loved us. And the next verse is below. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And in chapter three, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. John emphasizes the fact that we have passed out of death into life. Becoming a Christian is a resurrection. It's resurrection from death to life. It's a turning of hate to love. A lack of love indicates that one is spiritually dead. Love is the sure test of whether someone has experienced the new birth or is still in the darkness of spiritual death. So we need to examine a biblical definition of love. What is it and how is it demonstrated? What is misunderstood about love, I think, is that love does not equate to anything goes. The world thinks that love means that anything goes, that you can love any way that you want to. But God puts limits. He puts boundaries around our love. That is why pornography, fornication, adultery, polygamy, pedophilia, bestiality, and yes, homosexuality are sins. These things are not appropriate expressions of love, no matter what people feel about it. God has called these things sin, and many are unnatural sins. Now, not everyone agrees with what God has written in his word concerning these things. Loving people who live contrary to God's command does not mean we have to agree with them. You do not have to agree with someone in order to love them, but you do have to actually love them. And in this passage, we find a concise collection of statements for how we ought to live as a community of love. And in this passage, we see how we ought to love those in the church. What these verses deal with are basic to effective Christian living. So Paul's main point is here. What he's going to say is sacrificial, transformed living calls us to love others sincerely with a love that is genuine a love that is genuine. Remember that consistently throughout the New Testament, love is not an uncontrollable feeling that comes over you once in a while. Rather, it is a commandment. It is a commitment to be done and a commandment to be obeyed. The Lord Jesus made this explicit to us in John chapter 13. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you 
love one another. Just as I loved you, you also are to love one another. How did Jesus love us? Sacrificially, giving up of himself, putting the needs of the other in place of his own needs, his own desires. So the supreme demonstration of Jesus' love was when he went to the cross and when he bore the wrath of God on your behalf and on my behalf, he didn't do that because he just felt like it. He didn't feel an impulsive urge swelling up within himself to do something nice for us. He did it in obedience to the will of the Father. He gave it all for us. I was listening to, this is, this is a great, this is just kind of off the top of my head, sorry. I just get excited about this because I was listening to Michael Horton the other day teaching on communion. And he says, you know what? We sing that song, I Surrender All. Everybody knows that song, don't you? I surrender all, I surrender all. We sing it many times, but you know what? In the table of the Lord, in the communion, in the cup and in the bread, that is Jesus saying, I surrender all. You realize that? What an amazing Savior that we serve. In the communion, Christ is proclaiming, I surrender all. And it's all for you. And it's all for me. And it's all for the sin of the world. If they will put their trust in Christ Jesus and be reconciled to him. Amen. Jesus surrenders all. So based on that, based on our knowledge of Christ's self-sacrificing love on the cross, let's define biblical love in this way. And I will pin this to the top of the channel as well. This needs to be read over and over and over. Biblical love is this. It is a self-sacrificing, caring commitment that shows itself in seeking the highest good of the one loved. It's self-sacrificing. You're giving of yourself. You're giving caring commitment. You're demonstrating your love and you're seeking not your good, not your wants. You're try not trying to meet your needs. You're seeking the highest good of the one who is loved. Guess what? This is impossible. It is impossible to do. But, let me add, but, by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, you can choose to sacrifice your selfish interests on behalf of others with the aim that they also will be conformed to the image of Christ. That is their highest good. And the first fruit that results from walking in the Spirit is love. That's from Galatians 5.22. The, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. So Paul is going to, through this message, spell out five aspects of biblical love in each verse. Let's look at that first one in verse nine. Biblical love must be genuine and holy. Love cannot be covered over with hearts that are full of selfishness, jealousy, manipulation, and even hatred. We are after the interest of the other. It must be genuine. We can't have ulterior motives looking for something to gain for ourselves. The epitome of love with hypocrisy was when Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Outwardly, it looked as if he really cared for Jesus, as if he were a true disciple. But in reality, he was giving Jesus over to bloodthirsty men who would torture and kill him. 
But Paul is calling us to genuine love from the heart. The Greek word that Paul uses, that word genuine, means without hypocrisy. Now, if you remember, the word was used, that hypocrisy was used for the masks used by actors on the stage. You've probably seen these in advertisements for stage plays in our day. Some of the masks were happy. Others were sad. The actor did not necessarily feel as if the mask signaled, but the mask showed the role that he was playing. Paul says that our love for one another is not to be a phony mask or role playing, but it must be the real thing. We should generally desire God's best for others and speak and act toward that goal. Biblical love must be wise. It must be discerning. It must always be keeping in mind what is the highest good of the other person. It may not be for the person's highest good to just hand me money because you may be helping him to continue an irresponsible, lazy way of life. You may be enabling him to continue an undisciplined pattern of spend spending on frivolous things or you may be contributing to his dependence on a, a, a substance like alcohol or drugs. So biblical love sometimes has to confront sin rather than just being nice and ignoring sin. I love the way Vody Bauckham says, you know, we Christians have written the 11th commandment. You know what that is? The 11th commandment is this, thou shalt be nice. Sometimes, sometimes we have to confront sin, and sometimes it's not nice, and sometimes it's quite messy. Positively, to show love, you may need to teach that person biblical principles of stewardship and spend time helping them establish a budget or control his spending. Your heart motive is to help him to grow in godliness. But biblical love must not only be genuine, but holy and righteous. Paul admonished us to abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Christian love is to be shown purely and sincerely without self-centeredness. Paul's words obviously imply that there is an objective, knowable standard of what is evil and what is good. This standard does not change with the times or with the different cultures. God has revealed his holy standards of right and wrong in his word. Now, notice that Paul doesn't say to just avoid evil, but to abhor evil. We are to test evil. We are to hate it. The Greek word he used only here in the New Testament has the nuance of shrinking back in horror from evil. It is an emotional reaction against everything that displeases God. Since God hates sin, to be indifferent towards sin is to be indifferent towards God. So obviously, to laugh at evil is to be entertained by evil, whether in person or on a movie or a TV screen, is not to abhor it. We shrink back from evil. We abhor it. Second point about biblical love. Biblical, biblical love must be honorable. We are to love one another with brotherly affection. This is not a suggestion. This is a command, yet it also involves our emotions. But if we just put on a cloak of feelings, which we do not have, that would be hypocrisy. Rather, we must go back to the doctrines that Paul has expounded, those indicatives from Romans 1 all the way through chapter 11 and to the, real, the logical conclusion that he urges us in the first part of Romans 12. Then we will realize that it's by God's mercy we have been born into his family. 
along with all others who have trusted in Christ. None of us deserved it, but now we are all related through the new birth. That means some of you I may never see face to face on this earth, but you and I are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are united to him and we are united to one another by the Spirit. We are all related and we will be spending eternity together. So heartfelt obedience to these commands comes from responding to the teaching of who we are in Jesus Christ. All who believe in Christ are a part of God's family. We should feel closer to a brother or sister in Christ than we do to a relative who does not go, go do, who does not know Christ. Biblical love must be humble. It must be honoring. We are not to seek honor for ourselves, but rather genuinely to rejoice when others receive honor, and we don't. Paul is not saying that we should set aside our gifts or our knowledge and practice a kind of mock humility. That would contradict what Paul said in verse 3, when we are to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So we should have a true estimate of ourselves. We should not overestimate ourselves and underestimate others. And Paul reminds us of that fact in 1 Corinthians. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, that is the other apostles, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. We need the grace of God. Third point, biblical love must be fervent. True love motivates us to passionate service. Sometimes it's not easy to love. In fact, Sometimes it's downright hard. Some of us, and I put myself in this case, some of us are very unlovable. Some of us have, have traits that, wow, that person's really hard to love. You know, let's face it, you know, there are people that are hard to love. True love labors. True love is passionate. Verse 11 states this plainly. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. One thing I try to do is recognize, even in unbelievers, this person is created in the image of God. And I must recognize that. Another way to say this might be, never be lazy, but work hard. But a better way to understand this is to never let your zeal for the Lord wane. This seems to make better sense with the rest of the verse. Believers ought to be fervent. We ought to be passionate. We ought to be living for Christ with enthusiasm and energies. Christians ought to also be the most joyful people in the world. And yet many go around dejected and hopeless. Our energy our enthusiasms come not from our human efforts, but it is rooted in the spirit living within us. We must draw upon the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. So our love for the Lord and for each other should also motivate us to serve the Lord with gladness. God has called us together to be on mission for him. We ought to be passionately working, but remember for whom we serve. A church does not exist to serve itself, but exists to serve the Lord. We are not here for ourselves, but we are here to serve Jesus Christ. Once we stop doing that, we cease being the church, regardless of how cultural issues are decided, and no matter what sort of authority Christians' values have in culture, we must always be about the mission of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We must be passionate about 
his mission. If your passion for service has diminished, pray, God, renew that passion within my heart. Give me a deeper passion to do your will, for it's all for your glory alone. Brings us to our fourth point. Biblical love must be constant in prayer. The church may be looking at times of suffering. In fact, we are promised in scripture that we will be hated. Scripture tells us that we can expect persecution. There may be a time coming soon when preaching God's word becomes hate speech. What should the church do? How should we respond? Verse 12 answers that question. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. This passage tells us to rejoice in hope, to be patient in tribulation, and to be constant in prayer. Should we fear the future? No. We serve a God who holds the future in his hands. He is not surprised by anything that happens in this world. Should we be angry when sin is celebrated? Absolutely, yes. We ought to still be genuine and we should still seek that which is good. This world will have its share of difficulties, but the believer is to be steadfast in time of trouble. The realization that life is to some extent an obstacle course keeps a person from being surprised when things do not go as planned. We do not need to fear for we have the greatest hope. If we are in Christ, we do not fear the future when it is in his hands. Our God has overcome. Our God is in control. Now, afflictions and suffering will come, but they should be borne patiently. Now, I will admit that is easier said than done. But I did not say it. God's word says it. The source of spiritual help during such time is prayer. So Paul counseled his readers, be constant in prayer. In the most difficult of circumstances, true love overcomes through hope, through steadfastness, through prayer. True love bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things for the glory of Christ. I love that from the Psalms. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though, it is, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling because strength and dignity are our clothing. We have that strength through the power of the indwelling spirit. Verse 13, it closes out. Biblical love must be generous and giving. Genuine love will open our eyes to the needs of others, and it will move us to help when we can. Look at the final verse in this passage. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Paul indicated the moral responsibility of meeting the needs of others. Because we are members of Christ's body, we must take care of one another in every way. When someone is in need, others who have the means should share what they have in order to meet that need, whether it's financial or just daily necessities. This was a trademark of believers in the early church. Look through the book of Acts and you will see the church regularly caring for the needs of others. Is there someone you, need, you know who is in need? Can you meet that need or at least help meet that need? Can you also give to another with no expectation of thanks or return? Let love be genuine. Let love be generous. 
This does not mean necessarily helping only those in your community. In a day when ends were scarce and not always desirable, it was critical for believers to expend to extend hospitality to believers and unbelievers who were traveling. So showing hospitality to others was a mark of genuine love for others. In fact, we may never really know who we are helping. The author of Hebrews counseled hospitalities to strangers because we may perhaps entertain angels without knowing it. Jesus said helping others, the least of these, was helping him. So love Jesus by loving others, by caring for them. Let our love for others be an outflow of our love for Jesus Christ. Just a few conclusions and applications. How can we apply these scriptures to our lives today? First off, Instantly, beware, judge your selfishness and anger as sin. Ask God's forgiveness. He is willing, he is able, he is gracious to forgive. Self is the main enemy when we fail to love others. Sincerely ask forgiveness from the one you sinned against. Second, focus on God's love for you at the cross. I love in Ephesians 4, Paul writes, be kind to one other, another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ Jesus also forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us and an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Third, walk moment by moment in submission to and dependence on the Holy Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit, we will not carry out the deeds of the flesh. Rather, his fruit will grow in us. That is his love, his joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And last, memorize these scriptures. Memorize this part of scripture, which is 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Let me put it here for you. Love is patience. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and it is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Read these verses over and over every morning until they shape the way that you think. Post them on your mirror. Put them up in your house. Pond these things. Meditate upon these. And let us walk together in genuine love because biblical love is self-sacrificing. It is a caring commitment that shows itself in seeking the highest good of the one loved. Amen. There's only one way to do it. And that is that we do as Christ said in John chapter 15, and that is to abide in me as I abide in you. And I will close us out with this song. I'm going to sing us, I'm going to not sing us, maybe Shalom will sing for us. I'm gonna play us two songs. The first one is relates to what we just said, abide as we abide in Christ, we will learn how to grow in love. And then I'll close out with, he is Lord. And then I'll close us in prayer.
yes, he is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here among us. We thank you, Father, that you demonstrated your love to us that while we were yet vile, depraved, abominable sinners, you died for the ungodly. What an amazing Savior. What more can we say but praise you, Lord? We thank you. We praise you. Father, we ask you today to show us how to demonstrate genuine biblical love to others, a love that will outflow from your spirit through us to others. We thank you. We praise you for your word. Help us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for we give you all the glory and the praise in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we will be here again next Tuesday night, same time, same place. So please come. And I, it's always a privilege to teach you. May God bless you. Thank you.